the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, today's host, or one of today's panelists, sorry, is Brian Guinan of iSmart Building Group, and he's Perth's premium passive house builder and one of Builders Declare's, uh, Builder Declare Australia's founding members. Um, so Brian and I recorded this webinar earlier on today. Um, Brian has recently had his fourth child uh, and is currently on school pickup. Uh, he's located in Perth, so he's a couple of hours behind us. Uh, he will be joining us throughout uh, during the webinar, so he'll be able to answer any of your questions uh, later on. Um, today, Brian will talk about the basic ways heat and moisture can flow through a building envelope and assembly. I might just uh, circle back a little bit and just let you know that this webinar is on weather resistant barriers. Uh, the re relevance to our current NCC, so our National, National Construction Code and its requirements. The essential barrier functions of the building envelope. The most common types of WRB applications and dissect their full definition. How getting the building watertight before the roof and cladding goes on helps speed up the building process. Our following building envelope science can ensure that WRBs are applied correctly and effectively. I'd also like to have a big shout out to our sponsors today, uh, and that is ProClima Australia. Uh, we use ProClima Pro on all our projects. They're such a fantastic product. Now, I am going to share my screen in a second and press play on the pre-recording that Brian and I did earlier on today. So please bear with me as I do this. I've had plenty of practice today, so hopefully it works. So. Uh, Without further ado, I will share my screen. G'day, Brian. Thanks for taking your time out of your busy day. I understand you've got a bit going on in your life at the moment, so very much appreciative of you putting this time aside for us. No problem. Thanks, Sam, for having me. It's uh, much appreciated. No problems at all. Now, I'm personally super excited about this presentation because um, we do practice this on a daily basis on our site. So um, I know how fantastic it is to be um, implementing these kind of um, techniques into the building. So I'm, I'm super excited to share your knowledge with our other members and our, our guests today. So without further ado, I guess you can start sharing your screen and we'll we'll get things happening. Yeah, indeed. So I'll share my screen now, Ham, um, and you just let me know if you can see it and we'll start at the start and go from there. Perfect, all right, you can see. Okay. So we can see that? Yep. So a full screen or you can just see your slideshow? Yeah, just uh, go full screen, mate. Go, go slideshow, actually. Okay, good? Yep, beautiful. All right. I'll turn my video off and I'll let you uh, go, mate. Thanks very much, Ham. Yes. Okay, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good night to all of you, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Ham. Much appreciated. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brian Guinan. Um, I'm originally from Ireland. I'm a registered builder here in Western Australia. I've lived here for about 11 years. I'm a qualified carpenter. Um, I got on a passive house train probably about five, six years ago. Um, and as everybody knows, that's a rabbit hole that you don't come out of. So, you know, performance is key and performance is everything. So as soon as I jumped on that, I realized I needed to be a passive house tradesperson. And then recently I've become a passive house uh, consultant certified as well and a blower door tester, um, all of which are important to passive house. But Today, we're not here to talk about passive house. We're here to talk about WRBs, weather resistant barriers. Um, we're going to have, it's more of a conversation and a chat. We're not going to tell you what to do or how to do it. We're just going to give you information, as much information as we can. Um, and then what you do with that information is entirely up to you guys. But there's quite a bit of research gone into this. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy it. So firstly, before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsors, and that is Proclaim Australia. Um, I've been involved with Proclaim Australia for over six years now absolutely incredible bunch of people um the product range is absolutely out of this world what we can achieve with this product is insane it's fantastic and these guys have boots on the ground the the support is there the warranty packs is there and as you will see as we go through this um, this uh, webinar you'll get a lot of information that you know there's only a certain few companies in the world that can supply this kind of product and this quality and proclima is one of them so thanks to proclima for their sponsors for today's webinar Okay, so let's start at the very basics. What is a weather-resistant barrier? 
Um, essentially, it's part of a wall system. So we can't think of a weather resistive barrier as a solution to any one problem. It is a solution as part of an exterior wall system, and it's there to protect the building materials from external water penetration or vapor penetration. Um, it's basically a, se a shell for the building. Um, liquid water has penetrated through your external finish, your external finish being your cladding system, your curtain wall system, whatever it is that's on your building. Um, you're going to get moisture that penetrates through that system. And behind that, you then need to have your protection, your weather resistant barrier. Um, uh, control layers. So when we talk about a weather resistant barrier, we have a performance function and then a control method. Um, as you can see from this slide here, our performance functions are water, air, heat, vapor, sound, and fire. And depending, depending on your situation and your application, not all of these performance functions will be required, um, depending on whether it's commercial, residential. We tend to stick to, to residential in Builders Declare at the moment. Um, we are all residential builders, and this is what we know, and this is what we do well. Um, so for us, we're talking about water, air, heat, vapor and sound to a certain extent, but not essentially. We, we, we only worry about fire when we're talking about boundary walls. Um, and then your secondary relationships, which is the control method, uh, water shedding, water control layer, air control layer, vapor control layer, thermal control layer, and then building form and features. Now, all of this, we'll touch on each one of these individually, but not necessarily on importance, but they will be touched on individually as we go through the webinar. Uh, where should the WRB be located? Um, so when we talk about a WRB, weather resistant barrier, we need to ensure that it's out of the sun. So ideally not exposed to the UV. A lot of WRBs, people are incorporating them into an EFA system or some kind of a system that goes on the outside of the building. And they say, yeah, my vapor control layer is the render, but your render is exposed to UV. Ideally, we want a ventilated cavity, which our WRB is behind protected from the UV or protected from the inclement weathers. And it's also an air barrier. So we got a WRB, which is an air barrier, water barrier, air barrier, protected from the UV, um, and this ensures its longevity. Okay, so weather resistant barriers. Where did they come from? Um, a lot of people say it's not a weather resistant barrier, it's actually a water resistant barrier. Well, it's actually a weather resistant barrier, and the term did come from America. Um, ideally, it was to create a clear division between the standard building wrap, sacking, and a weather resistant barrier, uh, driven by continuous research and development. Now, the reason this research and development was implemented was because of leaky building syndrome. Now, anyone that's anybody in the building industry knows what leaky building syndrome is. We will touch on that as we go through the next few slides as well. Um, the clear difference between a uh, weather resistant barrier and a sacking is that it's wind tight, water tight, and air tight, or wind proof. And it also has the ability to release vapor from the structure when required. Now, these are all super important when we're talking about weather resistant barriers. Those items individually on their own, they're important, but they're not effective. If you put all together in one um, weather resistant barrier, then you have a very, very high end product and you will have a very, very healthy building structure. Okay. So when we talk about leaky building syndrome, we're going to touch on New Zealand. We know North America and parts of America had it really, really bad. But our neighbors, very close to us, New Zealand, these guys have, they've had it real bad, like 11.3 billion. And if we break that down into cost per unit or cost per dwelling, it's somewhere in the region, and people can argue this till the house come home, but the rough numbers are somewhere in the region of 120 to $160,000 per unit in rectification costs because of leaky building syndrome. Now, out of all of this, right, this started from houses built in early 1980s up to 2000. Then the code started to change. They did all their stuff, which we're doing right now, our current government are doing, which I'll show you in a few slides later. But out of this came the three Ds or the four Ds, deflection, drainage, drying, and durability. These four Ds are what their code is now based on, okay? So deflection is cladding. It's your outer layer. Make sure you get rid of your water okay, or as much of it as you can. Drainage, flashings, windows, sarkings. This comes, this comes to detailing. What is your detailing in your external cladding system? What is your detailing of your wall system? How are you going to get rid of that water if it does get in? Because it will get in. And then drying is the next one. Number three, ventilation and vapor. And again, a lot of people 
don't think that this is relevant in Australia, but it is. It is extremely relevant. Later in the slides, we'll go through ventilation and vapor, but in particular, ventilated cavities behind cladding systems. It's a crucial part of a weather-resistant barrier. Okay, you can have a weather-resistant barrier, but without the correct ventilation, you're limiting its performance. And the last one is durability, which is material selection. So the material that you have external of your weather-resistant barrier, the cheaper you go, the more water you're going to get in, okay? The worse the system is or the, the less detailing you do in your system, the more vapor, the more water, the more, um, the more intrusion you're going to get into that ventilated cavity or in between your external system and your internal weather-resistant barrier. And that's what we don't want. Okay, so why is air sealing important? Um, as part of a weather-resistant barrier, we know that basically airflow is energy flow, and energy flow is moisture or vapor transfer through your building. We know that. Like, I don't have to harp on about this. Everybody knows that moisture flow is airflow. It's airflow transfers moisture or transfers vapor through your building. Now, if you don't control that moisture, you have leaky building syndrome. Effectively, is what you have. You have energy transfer from the external environment, which is higher pressure, to the internal environment, which is lower pressure. Okay. Now, when that moisture passes through your building, at some point you have what's called a dew point, and that dew point is going to be in your wall structure. Okay. So you have moisture coming through through your external sacking or whatever it is. It's now in your structure, your timber frame, your steel frame, whatever frame the building is, and somewhere in that structure you're going to get moisture. That moisture will be condensation, which will be water, which will lead to rot, mold, mildew, all kinds of stuff in your structure, which is leaky building syndrome. Okay, we now know that leaky building syndrome is a national problem. Okay, it's not something that's limited to one specific climate or one specific area or location or one specific type of build. We know that. Okay, so on your screen right now, you're looking at Department of Health in all states. Okay, these are commissions and letters and and um, papers, reports that were commissioned by the government to look into mold and how it, how it how it actually is generated in our structures, where it comes from, what the effects are, and we know the paper is there. We can't we can't argue with this. The, it's all there. The evidence is there, and it shows us clearly that we do have household mold issues in structures all over Australia. Okay. Now further to that, we have condensation. So we've got a report that was issued in 2014, which was pretty much funded. It was funded by three organizations, but the, the major funder was the ABCB, so the Building Codes Board, okay? So the Building Codes recognized that there's an issue, recognized that we need a report. They did that report, and out of that report comes the final report, which deals with or tells us that we have an issue. We have condensation within the buildings as a complex and interrelated phenomenon, and successful mitigation strategy must take a holistic approach to the problem. Okay, that's effectively the nuts and bolts of what's come out of this report. Now, if we read into that, okay, which we will do, if we read into that in more detail, essentially what they're saying is that the creation of highly energy efficient and fireproof homes, right, which is what we're doing right now. We see our codes are are changing; they're upgrading all the time. We had 2019, we've got 2022. 2025, and they, they're constantly upgrading all the time, the codes. We're getting higher energy efficient homes. But in doing that, we have an unintended cons consequence of increasing the incidence of condensation and increasing the risk of damp dampness and more buildup, okay? Now, we know that the left hand, we know this is happening. But on the right hand, how are we dealing with it? And this is what we need to get into, and this is what we need to discuss today, okay? So... We see the signs throughout the industry, in the residential and commercial, of climate zones that is, is will be an ongoing issue, okay? We know it's an ongoing issue. We know it's coming. The reports are proof. The NCC is changing. I think one of the issues that we need to discuss or that at some point will be lobbied on government is that the current NCC is targeting better performance for buildings but neglecting to ensure the correct systems are in place to ensure its longevity and quality. So while the NCC and the ABCB and the relevant government industries and bodies, they're asking us to increase our performance on the homes so that the end user, the public, are getting a more energy efficient home. Are we then given the tools to make sure that they have a healthy home? 
that doesn't have mold and mildew or rot inside the structure, okay? Now, one of the biggest steps to that is a weather-resistant barrier, okay? So when we dial down into the codes, so we have a deem to, a deem to satisfy in our current codes right now, in the NCC, right? So we see membranes that pop up a few times in the code. So in 6.2, we're talking about pliable building membranes, right? And this is the only place that it tells us we need a membrane, okay? So you guys can get the code, pull it apart, but what at the moment our current code requires us to have a vapor permeable membrane in climate zones six, seven, and eight, okay? So for all of those people that are in four and five, which is the majority of our metro areas in Australia, the majority of them are in four and five, okay? But right now we talk about a vapor permeable membrane in climate zones six, seven, and eight. So when we talk about four and five, we're actually not required to have a membrane, okay? At the moment, we're not required. Okay, so we go back again to the report, the final report that was issued, and we talk about condensation and ventilation in that report in various detail, okay? We now have only applies to class one buildings. But we're talking about condensation here. So now we have a section of the code which is moisture management, which deals with condensation, okay? It's moisture management. But we have a full section on the code on water management or vapor control from the external environment, which is not being dealt with. So we've got the left hand not talking to the right hand. Okay? So it says risks associated with vapor control and condensation, and they must be managed to minimize their impact on the health of occupants. Okay? So when we talk about verification of condensation management for climate zones five, six, and se or sorry, six, seven, and eight. It tells us that to comply with it, we need to model our, our condensation management. So effectively, we need, to we need to model our wall systems, okay? We need to ensure indoor and outdoor temperature and humidity conditions, heating and cooling set points, rain absorption, wind pressure, solar radiation, and so on. But if we're going to comply with these, then how are we actually modeling the systems? Or is anybody modeling the systems when we don't have a control system to do that? Okay, so in NCC update, it's expected in the next two to five years. Now, we can't say it's next year. We can't say it's 2025. We don't know. But what we do know that it's coming. And four and five will have the same requirements as six, seven, and eight right now. Okay, that's what we're being told. That's what the lobby on the NCC is at the moment. And it's being lobbied quite heavily from various sides of the industry. So they're trying to get ahead of the curveball here so that we don't get leaky building syndrome. Okay. So if we look at four or five being compliant with six, seven, and eight, then that means we need a vapor permeable membrane. But not only do we need a vapor permeable membrane, we need to make sure it works. So we're looking at a weather resistant barrier that needs to be checked. And if we go back to that last slide, we got to make sure that we supply all of these items. Okay. So compliance with 2.4.7 when is verified when modeling that assesses the effects of. So if you're putting a membrane on your building, how do you know that you're complying unless you've modeled the system, the wall system, okay? Now, all of this is only verified by your climate. So you as builders, as engineers, as architects, as professionals in the industry, you must know your climate. That's the most important thing when you're talking about this. If we're talking about liabilities as a registered builder or liabilities as an engineer or as an architect specifying a, pro a product on a project, okay? We talk about redder resistant barriers. If you're talking about longevity and healthy health in your structure, you must know your codes, but more importantly, you must know your climate. Your codes are relevant to your climate. So there is climate zone. Um, this is the, the, what you're looking at right now. This slide is the, the, the map of the climate zones of Australia. Now we all know, and we can get into arguments about microclimates till the cows come home. We're not gonna do that here. This is basically one through eight, and we've got all eight climate zones here in Australia. You need to make sure that what you design and what you build is relevant to your code with reference to this climate or your local climate. Okay, now when we talk about climate zones, this here is a picture from climate zone five. This is a house that was built in Climate Zone 5 not more than four or five years ago, okay? You can see the black on the studs. So we've got a dew point on the back of that um, 
membrane on the internal of the structure. So this structure is rotting away from the inside out. And you can't see that. This is inside the house. So you've got mold on your insulation. You've got mold on your timber. Your timber is rotting out. You see the sole plate in that wall is completely rotting out. And this is not burning. This is, this is purely moisture in the structure. And this is due to... Um, there's a couple of reasons. Number one is it's not a vapor permeable membrane. Number two is it's direct fixed cladding. So it's not, um, uh, the external doesn't have a ventilated cavity, okay? So you've got that thermal bridge effect coming straight through the studs and you've got a dew point hitting on the back of the membrane right on the studs. So we know it's an issue. The question is, is how much of an issue is it and how many buildings are being built like this, okay? Now we'll touch on drainage plan versus ventilated cavity. So a lot of people would argue it's not needed, okay? So what we'll do is, uh, there's a bloke called Jesse Clark. Uh, he used to work for CSR. He now works for Proclima. He's a building scientist. It'd do anybody well to sit with this guy and have a beer. He is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. He has so much information. It's incredible. But he did um, some work, I don't know, probably four years ago, four or five years ago. And that work entailed research and development on ventilated cavity versus a drainage plan, okay? So let's dial it back a bit for a second. So what is a drainage plan and what is a ventilated cavity? So drainage plan is basically anything, anything that allows water to get for, from the top of a wall to the bottom of a wall and out at the bottom, but doesn't have ventilation or has very, very minimal ve ventilation. There are several products out there at the moment. Uh, Proclima has one themselves, which is a membrane and it's got some mesh on the back of it. And that mesh allows you to direct fix on your cladding straight onto that membrane, okay? Now, in certain climate zones, that's okay, all right? And as you see from the little box in your bottom right-hand side, you see drain cavity in certain areas is okay, all right? So less than 500 millimeter of annual rainfall, a drain cavity is okay, all right? But then when you get into anything more than 500 to a meter, and then a meter to 1500, you need a ventilated cavity, okay? Now, if you look at the map, that's pretty much all of the metro areas in Western Australia and Tasmania. And even Tasmania has water-sensitive material protected by durable materials. And that's a next level. So you're talking about ventilated cavity plus extremely high warranties or high yielding materials that you're using, okay? So this here, in, instead of me harping on about, oh, you should have a ventilated cavity and you shouldn't have a ventilated cavity, okay? As far as we're concerned, the evidence is right here. We need it. It's, it we can't argue it. We need it. Ventilated cavity needs to be behind the claddings, okay? If you want to have a healthy building, you need to be able to get that air and that moisture from the bottom up to the top and ventilate it out through. You should have ventilated cavity on your roof also. Okay, we can get into sizes of ventilated cavities, but that's another webinar. That is another thing that we need to do and we need to pull apart start to finish. But you need a ventilated cavity. If you're direct fixing your claddings straight to your wall system, then you need to have some kind of a wall um, uh, modeling done to prove that it's going to work correctly, to prove that you won't have what we just saw in that picture previously. If you direct fix cladding exactly like this with a membrane, then you have potential for condensation inside your wall frame. Okay, when we see wind-driven rain, direct fix cladding, vapors are going to get through, water's going to get through, it's going to sit on that membrane if it doesn't, if vapors pass through, even with a vapor permeable, if you get any kind of leak at all, if it's not an airtight membrane that's on there, you're going to get condensation on the back of it. Okay? So, now we'll go into the different type of WRBs. Okay? Now, there's a bit in this. I'm going to do my best. Like I said, Jesse Clark is the guru here. I got most of this information from Jesse. He's, like I said, he's an absolute guru when it comes to this. So, I'll do my best here to get through it. But essentially, there's there's diff four different classes of membrane. Polywoven foil, perforated foil, microporous, and non-porous, okay? Now, how we test these, or how we should be testing these, they're not fully tested like this as per code requirements, but how they should be tested is for vapor permeance, is it an air barrier, reflective air gap, water barrier, UV stability, and thermal stability, okay? Now, we get in, there is, there's also strengths 
with these membranes, there's punch strength and tensile strength, etc. But we're not going to go into that at the moment because we know that any member that's coming onto the market has to meet those requirements regardless. So when we look at a polywoven foil, it's basically a woven foil, exactly what it says, um, but it's it's not vapor permeable. It is an air barrier. It is a water barrier, but has it UV stability and has its thermal stability? Well, we don't know. It's not tested to that, so we don't know. The perforated foil, it is vapor permeable, but it's not an air barrier because we've punched holes in it, okay? It can't be a water barrier. It's impossible because you've punched holes in it to make it vapor permeable. So therefore, it fails. So as per the new code requirements coming out, you cannot use this in in 6, 7, and 8. And as per the new code requirements coming out, you can't put it in 4 and 5 either. But if you were to put this in 4 and 5 now, you would really, really need to make sure that you're covered. Okay? You really, really would need to make sure that you're covered. Okay? Next, we move on to microporous. It is vapor permeable. It is an air barrier. It doesn't have a reflective air gap. It is a water barrier. But UV stability and thermal stability, both of those are question mark. So have they got high UV stability and for what period of time? And then thermal stability, what is their maximum temperature? that they're tested to and what they reach. Okay, so I'm, I'm quietly confident that the requirement is 70 degrees, but there is plenty of data out there that's been done with testing in all kinds of states and all kinds of area that tell us behind the cladding in a ventilated cavity, be it in a roof, even with direct fixing claddings, direct fixing claddings on walls, we know that those areas get well above 70 degrees. So what we're required to achieve at the moment we're quietly confident that that's not it's not achieving what we need to achieve that bar needs to be raised okay and then finally we have non porous okay so that's vapor permeable it's an air barrier reflective air gap doesn't have it but as far as we're concerned the purpose is for vapor permeability and an air barrier it's a water barrier it's got uv stability with warranties and it's got thermal stability okay so it's been tested to 100 degrees plus okay so we know that a non-porous membrane has everything that we need. Now, if we're talking about a reflective air gap, if we're building correctly, we shouldn't be using our, our weather-resistant barrier as a reflective air gap, or we shouldn't be using it for thermal insulation, okay? Its purpose is, if you can achieve it, great, but its purpose is as a weather-resistant barrier. Okay, now, the science part. I'm not even gonna try <laughs> and get into this. But essentially, the difference between the old technology and the new technology. So when we go to microporous, which was the old technology, to T triple E monolithic or non-porous membrane, it's passive transport versus active transport. So on a microporous on a microporous membrane, it has tiny, tiny little holes in it. Okay, and those tiny, tiny holes allow the vapor to pass through. Okay, so it's made out of polymer, it's polypropylene, but it has tiny little it's calcium carbonate, the powder that's shaken over it while you make the membrane, and then the membranes are glued together under heat, and the vapor passes through that membrane through tiny little holes. Now, it's vapor that's passing through. It's not water, it's vapor, okay? Now, when we get into the non-porous membrane, that's real high science, this stuff. It's the same material is used to make airbags. So it's, it's tested in extremely low temperatures, it's, it's tested in extremely high temperatures, and performs the both. The warranties are incredible, like 100 years. It's, it's absolutely incredible how good this is. But the main focus on this is it's active transport, okay? So when we talk about active transport, it means that the vapors travel through the membrane at molecular level. So not through holes in the membrane. As we see on the left, it's traveling straight through holes in the membrane. Or, the, yeah, it's basically holes in the membrane. So as you see that, it passes external to internal or internal to external through holes in the membrane. Whereas an active transport, it's transferred through, vapors are transferred through on a molecular level. That's the only way I can describe it. Now, I will eventually try and get Jesse Clark to do a bit of a, a another webinar, which can go into the science of this if you want, okay? So we'll have a chat with him and see if Builders to Lair can get him on to do another webinar for us, okay? So how do we know that this works, all right? So on your screen, you will see Woofy. Woofy is a software. For anyone that's in the passive house industry, they know exactly what Woofy is, right? It's a German software. It's called Warme Unfucht Instanach. 
I call it wonderful, uncompromising, factual information because it's exactly what it is. So if we look at the screen on the left, all right, this is a standard fiber cement board with an air layer or a, um, uh, a class two or three membrane on the external. So if you look at the extreme left of those, those blocks, that's the outside of the wall. Then the extreme right is the inside of the wall. Okay. Now, as we look at that, I'll try and run my mouse over so you guys can see. So you see this here? This is condensation. Okay. So this is modeling this structure. So here is the timber frame. This is the cladding system on the outside. This is the inside or gyp rock. Okay. As you can see on the bottom. So now we see clearly with a class two and three membrane, we have condensation. Okay. Clear as day. So modeling that wall over how many ever years and usually woofy models anywhere from 30 to 60 years, depending on what you want. Okay. But when you're talking about a structure's longevity, you can't talk about 10 years. It needs to be, in my opinion, 50 years is where you need your structure needs to last a minimum of 50 years and maintain a healthy structure for that length period. Okay. So if we look at just this, this is one little snapshot of a woofy system. Now, if we look on the right, we've got a class three and four membrane. Okay. And here we see no condensation whatsoever. So this is a weather resistant barrier. This is a Proclima membrane that we're looking at right here. Okay. This is a weather resistant barrier with no transfer. We've got, we've got plenty of vapor transfer, but we've got no condensation here. So here's the evidence. This is what we need. Now, when we looked at the code a little bit, a little while ago, we went through some slides and we looked at the code and it says you need to ensure that you model your system, you model your wall system. Well, this is how you do it. Okay. You have to model your wall system, and in order to model your wall system, you must do it through Woofy. I don't know of any other software that can do this. There may be some out there, but for me, I don't know of any at the moment. Woofy is it. So when we build a house, we build a passive house, we run Woofy on the wall. And we make sure that that wall system, no matter where it is, and orientation-wise, these walls are going to be different. Climate zones, we've built in four, five, and six, and we know that they perform differently. And different, different climates require different membranes, require different... Um, Wall structures, okay? Condensation trap, so you can see. Your little note on the left-hand side, red line shows a condensation trap. No condensation trap. And the, that's with relative humidity at 100%, okay? So we know this works. But for all of you out there who are looking for solutions in how to make sure that your liability is minimized when you're building a structure and what membranes you need to use and how to use them, Woofy is the answer. Most definitely. If you want to ensure that you have no liability, you want to make sure that you get the right, get it right first time, Woofy is the answer. Okay. Now, in summary, um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, Ham. How am I doing, Matt? How are you doing well, mate? Keep chatting. I, I've, I've had been meaning to ask you a bunch of questions, but I, you're on the roll, but uh, I think I might chime in at the end and uh, maybe just a couple of takeaways on my end. But uh, keep, keep going, buddy. This is, uh, this is really great okay, stuff. No worries. Okay, so in summary, folks, um, basically, we need to ensure that we're not only code compliant, but we need to mitigate our risk and exposure to an unhealthy or decomposing building. We need to consider the correct weather-resistant barrier application for your specific design and climate. So if we take anything home, we take the mistakes from leaky building syndrome in America and New Zealand, and particularly New Zealand, and all we need to do is look at what came from that. Stop moisture getting in, allow, allow moisture to dry out should it get in, and apply the four Ds. It's that simple. Deflection, drainage, drying, durability. These guys have done the hard work for us, and they have paid heavily in the process. $11.3 billion to rectify mistakes. That I, I don't know if anybody was at fault. It was just something that they did, and at the time it was done, they didn't have any knowledge or information, but we do. As a building industry in Australia, we have all the information is there. It's right in front of us. We just need to use it. And if we choose to ignore it, then it's on us. So I think for me, red resistant barriers and is an it's it's a yeah it's a conversation that I guess it should be had in code level. I think the two sections of code need to talk to each other to make sure that they're 
you know, that the information from one is relayed to the other. We don't just have water penetration from the external. We also have vapor management issues from external to internal. And then we have dew points and we have vapor control and vapor management, and moisture management. All of these things need to be considered in unison. So, yeah, for me, if you guys have any questions, fire them out. I might just jump in here quickly, uh, yep. Brian. Um, I mean, thank you very much for that. That was really informative. And, you know, we've, we've been, um, you know, we ran down the, we jumped into the rabbit hole of Passive House a number of years ago as well. So we, we fully understand and appreciate and, you know, very thankful and grateful for your, for the information you've shared us today. Just a couple of takeaways that I've got from this. Um, basically, where we're sitting right now in Australia is that where it, it, it it's a matter it's only a matter of time when we start seeing leaky building. Yeah, I think it's already happening, um, and I think as builders now we're responsible to make the change uh, and really drive the change in the industry. Yeah. Um, one one of the other uh, other takeaways I've got here is um, uh, the success of a structure is not just in the wrap but it's also in the entire system of the wall assembly. So it includes yeah. ventilated cavities. So yes, not just a matter of putting that building wrap on, but it's also providing uh, a plane uh, for water to either drain or, or for that vapour to dry out with that ventilated cavity. Yeah, it, it's, it's a full system approach, Hamish. Um, it's not just even just having a ventilated cavity. You can have a ventilated cavity, you can have the right membrane. But if you don't have the right flashing details, if you don't have the right tapes to make sure that the membrane is sealed, um, if you don't have the right junction detailing, all of these things are extremely important. So just wrapping a building is not enough. It's ventilated cavities, it's systems, flashings, detailing, ventilation strips, uh, junction details from roof to walls. There's so much involved in it. Now it is, it's not ridiculously hard to achieve, it's just a process, I think, that needs to be integrated into the industry as a whole. Well, I've just had a great idea for a Builders Declare event. Maybe we should uh, invite everyone along to a house and uh, show everyone how we're doing these window details, or flashing details and stuff like that. That'd be, that'd be pretty Yeah, cool. for sure. Yep. Um, one of the other takeaways here is, uh, you know, is talking about the membranes that you're using and, you know, let's give Proclimber a bit of a plug here. We've been using Proclimber for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, basically, those non-porous wraps are really giving us everything that we want in those building wraps, um, whether that's extasana on the walls or mento on the roof. Um, for me, it, um, using these particular wraps, a uh, couple of things, you know, we're, we're providing a good airtight environment or helping to create that airtight environment, which in a passive house point of view brings, you know, things back into control for us on the inside, but it's also protecting the uh, structure as well. So. I know internal wraps is probably a whole another um, uh, webinar, but just yeah. putting these really good high performing building wraps externally, it's yeah. just protecting our frame, but it's also helping us uh, the thermal performance of the inside of the house as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And we do know that like we already have air tightness in the code at the moment, not a requirement, but it's in there. So we know at some point it's gonna come in as a requirement. Uh, I think the, the number's around 10 at the moment. Uh, we're actually doing a project right now um, for one of the chippies that works for us. Um, so he's building a timber frame house at the moment, not the passive standards, but we are looking at putting the external membranes on, tightening them up to the external wall plate all the way around, and then just buttoning it up nice and tight, not going overboard. And then we're going to test that house to see how that performs with air tightness. So that like, if we're looking at, you know, making something achievable for the industry, if we're talking about 10 air exchanges, then in reality, it's going to be in that external wrap. Oh yeah, I mean, that's I, I think if you if you're using decent windows and uh, taping all your joins and windows and all that kind of stuff, I mean, if, yeah. you, if you can't get down around the five, then you're not doing five yeah. changes now. You're not doing uh, doing your job right. One of the other interesting um, things you brought up was using the Woofy software um, and how important it is to actually model our wall assemblies. Um, and it's, I think it's a really good example of you know showing how that condensation forms and where it forms and why it forms. I mean, if we look at that Wolfie um, graph and then think back to that frame that you uh, showed us of where that uh, the dew point was and the rotting of the frame, I mean, that is what's happening um, in that diagram there. Yeah, yeah, 100%, Hamish. Like, 
when I saw Woofy for the first time, I was like, oh, what's going on here? It's right here. The answer is there. Yeah. Like yeah. this is this is just non runner. We shouldn't even be having a conversation about this anymore. If if, if this model's a wall for us for that period of time and exactly how the wall's gonna perform in any climate you want, like one through eight, you just put in the, the different climate, then it's not we shouldn't have leaky building syndrome. It shouldn't be shouldn't be an issue, it shouldn't be a conversation even. Yeah, yeah, well, I agree. Mate, I reckon well, let's wrap it up because I know you've got a lot on your hands at the moment, but um I, I'm I have absolutely no doubt that this has been really informative for uh, all the viewers now and hopefully you're joining us now from school pickup and we can throw to a few <laughs> questions so I'll uh, I'll stop this recording and um, we'll try and grab to try and grab a couple of questions thanks very much Hamish and I just give one last shout out to Proclima they've been absolutely fantastic with sponsoring and you know with assistance for this webinar with all the material these guys are yeah boots on the ground like I said products are incredible but the assistance is is just as good Absolutely. And look, there's uh, pro climate days across the nation, which, uh, yeah. you know, everyone can join. So be sure to follow them on Instagram and reach out to your local supplier as well, because they really do make such a fantastic product. Yep. All right. I'll see you. All right. Sorry about that. Just getting uh back into uh live mode here um brian how you doing mate yeah pretty good mate you pretty good yeah not too bad how's uh how's everything on the home front there yeah not too bad kids are home now mate and i've got a i'm a year three footy coach so i'm just getting prepped for that now and we're heading out the door in another 20 minutes or so mate thanks again for uh taking the time i know you're a busy man and uh, i can see you're in your other office now um, <laughs> do you have a, uh, I think we've got a few questions here. Um, so I, okay, here we go. What WRB would you recommend for a hebel cladded wall on a boundary that needs to be connected from the inside? This is actually a great question because I've often racked my brain about it. So how would we do a WRB from the inside? Don't know. I need to know A, where it is, B, what this, the wall structure is, and C, what the fire rating is. It's it's not a question I can answer straight off the bat. Um, <laughs> if if anybody has a, a detailed question like that, you stick it in an email and email it over to me. And then ideally, or better again, stick it in an email and send it to the team at Proclima. These guys have built building scientists on the payroll there full time. These guys can give you the right answers. Rather than getting an answer off me that may be you know, on the safe side, go straight to the source. And these guys are the source. They've got boots on the ground. They've got the information that you need. Perfect. Yeah, good Good call. Uh, we have another comment here saying yes to the science. I love that comment. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> another uh, question here. Uh, usually in a passive house, they use membranes on the inside as well. Could you yep. explain why and what the difference is? Uh, so the membranes on the inside on a passive house, the primary focus would be, depending on what your structure is, but the primary focus is air tightness, but they're also a vapor control layer. So you have a vapor control layer on the internal of the building as well as the external of the building. But the primary focus on passive house would be for air tightness. So the systems that Proclima in particular supply is it's a, an, an Intello. So it's Proclima Intello. That's yep. an airtight membrane that is, um, it's a, um, vapor permeable both ways. So yep. it allows vapor to pass from the inside to the outside or from the inside of the wall frame to the inside of the building. So if you've got a high moisture content inside the building, um, if your humidity levels are too high, that vapor control layer will allow that moisture to get back into the frame of the structure and then pass through the external weather resistant barrier to the outside. That's the yep. primary difference. But yep. I think for most people, the primary focus in, in climates, say four through seven, that would be the focus. It would be yeah. its primary purpose would be an airtight layer. Yeah, yeah. Yep, perfect. Uh, another uh, question. Do you need a weather resistant barrier on the roof? Yeah, of course you do. Yeah, yeah. You need a weather resistant barrier on all external walls, including the roof. A lot of people use um, uh, anti-con on the roof, like an insulation underneath the sheeting. That's fine to use too. But you just need, again, to look at your structure, how it's constructed. So where is your insulation layer? What kind of a structure is the roof? 
Uh, what we build in particular, and I can only give you the examples that we build. So we use Proclima Mento, which is a vapor permeable weather resistant barrier on the roof that goes right on the rafters. Then there's counter battens to give us a ventilated cavity and then our main battens for the roof. Um, and then that membrane is then taped to the wall, which creates a, a clean ventilated cavity from the wall all the way up to the roof, which ventilates out the ridge. Um, and then our ceiling insulation is right on the ceiling. So we don't use the Anticon as an insulation layer up on the roof with the reflective air gap and stuff like that. We use a continuous insulation layer all the way around the structure. Well, your, your Anticon would end up outside the thermal envelope anyway. It's usually just it does, yeah. So there, it's... Right? Yeah, it's a little bit of a, I wouldn't say a loophole, but it's something that personally I don't agree with. Um, if if we were to put Anticon on a building, and we have done several times, and it's mainly because a client wants it and insists on it. And for me, its primary focus is for noise. If you yeah. have a hailstorm, yeah. then it dampens the sound considerably. But yeah. I'm open to conversation to be told different. Look, and look, from a, from a performance point of view, uh, or sorry, not from a performance point of view, um, if we're just wrapping our buildings in these weather-resistant membranes, I mean, we're essentially watertight. We're, we're, we're quickening yeah. up, uh, you know, our watertight of some means we can start splitting trades inside and outside. I mean, that's well, one of the many reasons why I love using these products as well. Yeah, we have one we're building at the moment, single story house, very, very simple. We started three weeks ago. We have, like, we're, you know, it's a bit of difficulty getting trades, but the thing was watertight after a week. Internal trades are doing fit out, um, chew out for plumbing, first fix for electrical, and we're cladding the external building and there's no roof tin on the roof, but yeah. it's still watertight. And then yeah. roof tin went on today. So you don't have to sit and wait, to put your roof tin on because you already have your, your weather resistant barriers in place and it's buttoned up tight. Yep, yep. No, that's, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, where can people find the Woofy software? And I assume you get different results in different climates. Exactly correct. You will. No matter where you are, you will get different results. And it all depends on your wall structure. If you type Woofy into your Google search, Woofy Australia, there's heaps of guys on there to do it. Yeah. Heaps. And it's a, it's a specific, I had one of my staff sent and we did the course in Woofy. And it is, yeah, it's extremely difficult and extremely detailed. So my advice is leave it to the professionals. Don't even try. Yep. Tell them what you what your what your process is or what you think you're going to do with your wall system before you actually do a woofy on it. And you might be able to get some advice about, you know, how to change it or how to make it a little bit better before you actually spend the money on doing the woofy. But I, mean, yeah. I think uh, I think thermal modeling of a building is probably another good webinar to to, to yeah to yeah. To, to, you know, to, to put for a future webinar. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Really great people out there that uh, are doing some good stuff and it's a really great indication of how your buildings can perform as well. Yeah, for sure, yeah. How do you finish the WRB at slab base? And this is probably a, also has other implications with termite barriers and all that kind of stuff too. So I think every detail is going to be different, but um, yeah, how do you finish the WRB at slab base? You've just answered that question, Hamish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every single detail is different. So we have yeah. our own details and our details, even our details differ from project to project with different types of claddings. And as professionals and builders in the industry, you have to come back to product warranties and product inst installations. All products have different installation requirements in order to maintain your warranties. So where one connection detail works really well, on one project, it may not be feasible for another project in order to maintain the warranties for the claddings. So that's a step-by-step -step process. And as we said in the webinar earlier, it's a, it's detailing and it's a system. Now, if you jump onto the Proclima website, you can go into, they have a page on the website which has details. And they've got heaps of details, starter flashing details, termination flashing details, junction details, roof to wall, all kinds of different details in there. And these guys have spent, yeah, well in excess of a couple of million bucks just trying to get these things right to make sure that there's longevity and they actually work. So if I was asking for details as a starting point, go to the Proclima website and use their guys. These guys have done the hard work for you. Yeah, and I think the, the important thing to kind of really press on here is the fact that, you know, every detail is going to be different. Every situation is going to be different. Yeah. And um, yeah. it probably really highlights the importance of, you know, really working through these details prior to construction as well. And yeah, for sure. And not trying to figuring out figure, figuring them out on site. I mean, especially when we start talking about a passive house uh, and air tightness and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, mm. yeah, 
Yeah, I build a pro climber website. Probably a good place to start, though. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. They have a details library on there, and it is it's absolutely fantastic. And that's been built through like guys like myself and yourself, Hamish, and all the other distributors around Australia who have been building for the last five or six years and, you know, figuring these details out. And, and then the science guys in Proclima, like testing these things in labs. And yeah, it, it's not like they just throw a picture and put it on the website. This yeah. stuff, it actually works. There's a lot of thought process and detailing and, and research gone into those. And, and I think like if we we're talking about like making our buildings last for a long, long time, I mean, my advice to anybody would just be to ask the question, you know, if you see someone yeah. on Instagram, you like their stuff, ask the question, jump yeah. on a website, ask the question. Like my experience in this space is that everyone wants to help. Everyone wants to, you know, build our buildings better. So yeah. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Most um, we've, we've kind of answered this question before, uh, how do you go with rain noise on a metal roof without the anti-con? So if you have, and, and this is, a, I wouldn't say a point of contention, but it's something that uh, as past house builder, it's not, an, it's a non-runner. It's not an issue because we have an airtight building, right? So sound travels through air. That's the first thing. So we're not going to block out all the noise, but on every one of the ceilings that we have, we have either an R5 in, in uh, closed cavity or we have an R6 in a ventilated cavity roof space. So an R6 installed correctly, you're getting minimal noise through it, minimal. Yeah. So to date, that's one thing that we haven't had come back from a client. We've never had an issue with noise. Beautiful. Full disclosure, if your homes do have noise, that's you know not something that we're here to solve. No. <laughs> uh, no. What size counterbatten do you use on the roof and walls? So um, this is something that I think we should delve into in another webinar, Hamish. But look, in a perfect world, 20 mil or more. Okay, that, that's the rule of thumb, 20 mil or more. Now, when we do our ventilated cavities on verticals, so on all walls, we use 35 mil batten because you do get, when you put the insulation into the wall, it's bulk insulation, and it does tend to shove the membrane slightly. Okay, so we will use a 35 mil batten a, because we know that the membrane's bulk, but B, because of availability. So we know that we can get 9035, 7035 off the shelf. It's ready available and it's there. It's cheap. It's effective. It does the trick. And we always, another point to that is if you're ever doing external cavities, ventilated cavities, make sure that it's H3. Don't put H2 on the external of your building. That is a ventilated cavity. It's going to have lots of moisture and lots of vapors. Make sure it's H3. We see a lot of people adapting to external ventilated cavities and they're using H2. My advice would be to ensure that you use H3 in those cavities. Yeah, that's, um, that's, on, good. That, that, that's good advice. You and I were actually talking about that the other day. So it's certainly something yeah. we're looking at putting on now, our project yeah. now on. On the roofs we use, um, and again, it's an availability thing. We have availability of uh, 40 by 18 uh, H3 batten. So we use those on the roof. Yeah. And that's for the counter batten. So this is an interesting question. Um, how would you go about, uh, and I think it goes back to detailing, uh, how would you go about detailing when you've already got completed construction drawings that don't include cavities or the other passive health methodologies or technologies? Do we just make some new details or wall type junctions based on advice from Pro Climber? That's a very risk loaded question, I think. <laughs> Yeah, like it obviously sounds like you're interested and it sounds like you want to do the right thing, whoever sent the question in. So my advice is whoever drew the drawings, go back to the person that drew the drawings and explain exactly why you want to do what you want to do. And if you want to do it right, redo the drawings. Yeah, I don't I, don't, I, don't I, cut I it short. I couldn't agree more. I mean, we need to we need to look at where the risk lies and where the liability lies. I mean, if, if mm. we're building off approved drawings from the architect and we execute it in a certain way, the ultimate responsibility comes down to us as builders, you know, if that yeah. performs. Yep. So as a builder, you want to make sure that um, those details are right and are going to work. So my advice would be to get the drawings updated so everyone, as to use one of Brian's sayings, everyone's singing out of the same hymn book. Yeah, very important. Yeah. And if you're serious, if you're really serious about the change, you will do that regardless. You yeah. will know that that's the, right, that's the right thing to do. It's the right. If you only have half-baked solutions and you go to site, 
And so you get some guys that are really clever, they'll understand it. And you get some guys that are not so clever and don't really care. And then you get a half-baked system, which means liability is back on you. It's that simple. Yeah. As the builder, the liability always rests with the builder. Yeah. And, and as a builder, I'm a builder myself. I know, I know where liabilities lie. And for me, it's always the right way. Yeah. And it's got to be the right way. Ask, ask a bunch of questions, right? There's a lot of great information out there and a lot of people willing to share the information. So, you know, yeah. want to, yep. it's always people that are prepared to or willing to give advice. So yep. uh, what sort of detail do you use when you have eaves? You take the weather, weather resistant barrier under bottom of rafter or tape between the rafters? So there's 50 ways to skin a cat. Yep. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm serious. So there, there is, again, depending on your climate, depending on what membranes you're using, there's, there's a probably three to four different ways to do your eave and roof junction. We've chose, if you go on our Facebook or on our Instagram, you'll see we've detailed our eaves many, many times. So just troll through our Facebook, you'll see how we detail them, okay? To ensure the cavity runs all the way up. Again, I'll go back to the same thing. Go to the library. Go to the Proclima website and go to the library. They're on there. Now, some of them may be more difficult than others, but I'm sure if you go through everything and pick up the phone, go to other guys that are doing it. Hamish is doing it. We're doing it. And we're not the only passive house builders in, in Australia. Not only that, we're not the only, like there's plenty of builders that are not building passive house, but they are doing the right thing. Yep. So the information is out there. And yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I mean, I'll be put my first, I'll put my hand up and, and be the first person to admit that I've made plenty of mistakes when it's come to detailing. And, I'm, you know, I think we've, we've come to a pretty good, system when it comes to detailing around rafters. My preference personally is to um, actually cut around the rafters and, and join the um, uh, the Mento up with the Extasana and then tape and detail around the rafter penetrations. But some people just want to wrap it around the whole lot and then tape it like that. So it's, you know, as Brian said. We've done both. We've done yeah. both. And yeah. both are successful. It just yeah. depends on, for me, and I've had this conversation with many, many people, it depends on where you're moving forward in the industry. And I always try and figure out what the shortcut's going to be and what's the fallout from the shortcut. So if we do it a certain way and then other people start to adopt that particular way of doing it, what's the shortcuts that they're going to take when they're doing that? Because they will take the shortcuts. And what's the side effect of those shortcuts? And then when eventually you settle on a, a system and a process to do something it needs to be or you want it to be the system that has the least amount of risk factor to take shortcuts yep uh there's a couple more comments here and then i think we're probably about to wrap up brian so we can let you get back to doing what you yeah, do i'm getting pretty tight on time now yeah no you're good man um so just one more so someone just said um so nick said 42 by 18 design pine for counter battens i mean my comment to that would be you know if you've got a if you've got deep pockets, use design pine. Yeah, 100%. If you've got um, deep pockets, go for it. It looks good too. Yeah, it looks great, but then you're going to cover it up. But uh, look, yeah. th that, that would definitely work in my eyes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Brian, yep. we're going to wrap it up, mate. You go. Um, thank you very much for your time and expertise. I know from where I'm sitting, it's been incredibly informative and you know, even though we've been doing it for a few years now, I've certainly learned a lot. So thank you very much. Um, if you need to go, mate, go. I'll wrap it up here, and um, we'll catch up. Uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone for tuning in, and thanks again to Proclima and Builders at Clare. Fantastic show. Appreciate Perfect. everything you guys do. Chat soon. Thanks, buddy. Cheers. Bye. And uh, I'll wrap it up here too. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, stay tuned for our next webinar, which will be next month. Uh, the uh, our guests to be confirmed. Um, we will be uh, starting or um, rolling out a podcast soon, which we will provide more details on our Instagram, Facebook page and all our other socials. Um, if you wanna get in contact with us, uh, info at buildersdeclare.com. You can always get in contact with us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed it and I will see you next time. Cheers.